Hi, welcome to Kerrigan Fishing. I'm Adam Kerrigan. Um, I won't lie to you, friends and family. For about the last two weeks, I've been in something of a slump. Lots of different things are going wrong. Some of them I can control, some of them I definitely can't. And when I'm in a slump, I've got a certain process that I use. Now, what this process involves is breaking down fishing into three distinct components. The first component are your tools. That, that could be anything. That could be your lures, your rods, your reels, your covers, your fish slippers, your boat, right? Anything or everything that you would use to, you know, get out there and catch fish. The second component are your choices. We all have things that work for us. We all have things that don't work for us. Your choices, the things that you do, the way that you decide you're going to make use of these tools. That's the second component. The third component is execution. Do you have the ability to consistently effectuate your choices? Now that we've defined the three components, what's the system? Well, it's like this. When you're out fishing, you can't control whether or not the fish are going to bite. You can't control the weather. You can't control the water conditions. Different things that are different from day to day that may work in your favor or they may not. Stop worrying about them. Control the things that you can. One of the things that I do, and this sounds completely silly, but when I'm in a slump, I wash my boat. Why? It's an act of maintenance. And no matter what happens, if I go out and I get skunked, if I go out and I miss five hook sets like I did yesterday, something that I controlled improved. Another thing that I'll do is make sure that my equipment is up to snuff. Fresh line on the reel, right? If I have a clip like I'm using here, make sure that that's been retied and it's ready to go. Make sure that everything has been lubricated and, and all, all the stuff is functioning the way that it's supposed to function because the last thing that you want is to have something go wrong while you're out on the water. That's just another thing that we end up blaming for a bad outing when it was ours to control all along. So we've talked enough about tools. Make sure your stuff is in good working order before you actually roll out. Do things. Spend time. Engage in maintaining your gear. Eliminate that as a possible factor. The next thing, control your choices. I spend time on the water thinking about which presentation is the right presentation or is the color that I'm throwing the right color. Maybe I need to put a different frog on. No, get that stuff out of your head. You all have certain lures, certain presentations that you're comfortable with. In the interest of, of, of working on that third point, the execution phase, what we need to do is restrict the number of choices that we allow ourselves to have. So what I do is I whittle myself down to a handful of lures and I only allow myself to use those lures and I learn from whatever they have to teach me. Keep track of your execution of the things that you choose to do. If you go out there and you make a bad cast, say it out loud. That was not what I wanted to do. Make your retrieval and try again. If you make a perfect cast, say it out loud. That was perfect. That's exactly where I want to be. Give yourself those auditory cues so that you can kind of maintain a mental inventory of what you're executing well and what you're not. So even if I go out tonight and I throw my selection of four lures and I get skunked, what are the positive things that I get to take away from it? One, my gear's in better shape when I went out than it would have been if I didn't employ this, mes this method. That's, that's an improvement. Even though I didn't catch fish, I improved as an angler. Two, I'm going to keep track of my execution of my choices. Am I hitting underhand casts the way that I want to? Is my overhand technique the way that it's supposed to be? 
Am I consistently executing the things that I want to execute that I believe are going to put me on the fish? So these are the four lures that I've elected to go with. You'll see that I've got two subsurface options and I've got two top water options. What we have here is the Mega Frogs Popcorn Frog. This is the top water frog that I am most comfortable with. This is the one that I have the most confidence in. Therefore, it's going to be the top water frog that I select. And whenever I'm in a situation where I need to throw a top water silent frog, this is going to be the one that I go with. Sometimes I want to be able to search things out and still be on top water. This is my noisy top water lure. This is the Tekel Honker Frog. And as far as noisy top water frogs are concerned, it's about as good as they get. For subsurface applications, sometimes you want something that's going to make a little bit of commotion underwater. What we have here is a classic Z-Man, and mostly white, and I like to outfit mine with a, a trailer. Um, this is going to run below the surface. It's going to make those vibrations. It's going to cause that noise. It's going to give that little bit of flash, right? This is my number one subsurface presentation. But if this isn't working for me, if I need something to be a little bit more weedless than what a chatterbait would allow, notice my hooks are rusty. I need to take care of that. I'm going to throw a weighted underspin. So I'm going to go out in the water today, and I'm going to restrict myself to the use of only these four lures after I clean them up and maintain them, that is. And I'm going to find out what the day has to teach me. This is the part where I stop lecturing you and I go get in my boat. Well, the evening didn't get off to a great start for me. I ended up on the water 20 or 30 minutes late after getting held up from work on the first occasion that I was ever meeting a fellow YouTuber for a collaboration session. Hi, sorry I'm late. Set the world on fire yet? Bro, I'll be honest with you, man. Ever since Ida, the bike's been screwed up. At least for me. By the way, hi, I'm Adam. <laughs> All right, so I am joined out here on the water today with David, AKA Orange 22 Fishing, uh, Delaware guy, local guy. I've been watching this content for a while and uh, I found it both inspiring and informative. We will make sure to link his channel down below so that you get the opportunity to learn as much from him as I have. We're out here getting snakehead today. All right, so you ready to do this, brother? We're right on, man. But you can't get right into it with a new fishing buddy. You gotta flap your gums. Yeah. So, so, like the the reason that I'm I'm really into being with the Legion is because they're a multi-species advocacy group, right? Like what it's about is first and foremost healthy fisheries. And for a while, like I've I've believed when I look at the research that comes from guys like Odenkirk, it's 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 telling us that snakehead being here isn't as harmful as we thought. That's the first thing, right? But the second thing it's telling us is biomass is going down. Why? Yeah. If it's not the snakehead, what is it? So people that want to get upset about snakeheads being here or kill them all and all that other good stuff, they're entitled to their opinion, their views, whatever they want, right? Yeah. Keep being mad because as long as you're mad, research is getting done. And it's pretty obvious that research is going to show snakeheads aren't the problem. And every little piece of the puzzle that you pay for with your outrage gets us closer to a healthier fishery. So I, I don't know, man. I mean, like I, I'm in it for the fishery as a bigger part of the environment as a whole. Yeah. And fishing lets me see metrics that other people can't see about what I'm drinking. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, you got a point. And if I get to catch fish while I'm doing it, <laughs> why not, right? So the first lure I like to go with is the honker frog. And the reason that I select that particular lure has to do with the vegetation that's around me. The water's uniformly one to two feet deep. The vegetation is relatively loose. And this gives me an opportunity to try to draw fish out that are hiding out under the duckweed or in the weeds. I'm also experimenting with a couple of different return techniques on the honker frog. Traditionally, I'll slow roll it back and drag the lure across the surface of the water. 
but I've been watching some videos and learned that there is a faster twitch technique that seems to be effective when the bite is slow. This was my attempt to get better at that. This happened to also be one of those nights where the wind just would not stop blowing directly in your face. It was hard to maintain position, so I ended up kind of giving in and letting myself rest up against the vegetation. I'm always one to try to take advantage of whatever the terrain gives me, so in a situation like this one where I've got a little bit of vegetation shooting out on the right, I'll use that as cover or concealment for my boat. I'll cast over it and drag the lure right over the top of those weeds. Now, if you're running light line, that can be a problem, but it, if you're running 30 to 50 pound test, like I am here, I believe that's Daiwa Grand X8 and 30, uh, it's usually not an issue to drag a fish out of that cover. I do believe that it's sufficient time experimenting with the honker frog. I have moved one fish but no bites, so it's time to change it up. This is where David hooks up with his first fish for the evening. Nice. Yeah. So you just confirmed something I was thinking. Wind break. I'm heading over to the other side. <laughs> When you're snakehead fishing, you can never, ever, ever take the direction of the wind for granted. Nice fish, dude. <laughs> so here's what I'm talking about when I'm getting into execution, right? We've got a cut here, we got a pocket here, we've got another pocket there, right? Another cut that sits off in this direction. When you're frog fishing, precision is super important. So the perfect cast is going to land just beyond where it is that you want to fish. And you're going to let it sit and let it the, the ripples settle before you retrieve. So we're going to work this first cut right here where we're seeing this activity. Exactly like that. Perfect. Okay, missed it. Notice that the wind is pushing my boat backwards, away from the position of the snakehead. This is one of those situations where pedal drive is a real difference maker. Missed it. Hit him again. Oh, that's twice. The bite is really, really, really soft. Boss has got one over here. Snakehead or bowfin? Nice. Chatterbait? <laughs> huh? I think I've talked to you before out here. You need me to snap a photo? I got you, brother. Look at that. Okay. That should be good. Now I'm too close. <laughs> it's not a good month, September day. I don't know why. Six and change. We've got a snake at 4 and a half hours. <laughs> I got to spend the rest of my session listening to his stories. I hear you. I hear you. I don't mind. Respect your elder fisherman. One day it's going to be you. You know, I got to be honest. You know, even though 
the skunk continues. It was a pretty doggone good night. Well, friends and family, we fished until the last bell, and unfortunately tonight we were not able to hook into any fish, but that does not mean that it was a bad night. We made a new friend out on the water and David over at Orange 22. We improved the state of our gear. We executed a bunch of really good casts. So you take the positive and you move on from there. We'll be back out again soon, and when we do, We'll be in a better position than we were when we went out today. So thanks for watching the video. Again, if you haven't already liked and subscribed, go ahead and knock that out now for always improving. And remember, it's never too late to care again.